one of the tenets of the show, and I think it's really important for the audience to know, is that we're not a show that intends to string out secrets forever. I mean, I think by the end of the first, sequ first season, you will understand the entire mythology that we need you to understand to be able to enjoy the show. Okay. You know, there will be future mysteries, but we're not going to be one of those shows that strings you along with just question after question, question, after question not question. getting you an answer. I don't watch those shows. So I believe that the characters we've created and the world we've created and this fundamental idea of what if somebody could wander into your dreams is compelling enough that I don't need secrets. Okay. We as a bunch of storytellers, it's not going to be one of those shows where it's like, oh God, will they just give me the answer already so I can stop watching. Anybody else had that experience with the show? <laughs> did that come, a lot of times. Did that come from Gail and her experience in delivering the goods? No, also? actually, that came from me watching television and getting really angry at television. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I always try to do is I try to watch other shows and watch the media that I consume and what do I enjoy and how do I think about it, you know? And, you know, I think people watch television in many different ways and want many different things out of a television show. I think, look... I sit with my wife and still watch Grey's Anatomy. I watch Nashville. <laughs> but I wrote Brotherhood, which is, you know, this dark, gritty drama that's a completely different show. And when I watch shows like Brotherhood, I watch them differently. And it's not better or worse. I just write shows that I really want the audience to pay, have to pay a lot of attention to. I want to treat the audience as if they have a lot of intelligence, as if they're interested in this world and they don't want to be pandered to. I want my audience to be engaged. I want them to lean forward. I want them to have questions. And I want them to want the answers to that questions. And even after I give them the answers to those questions, I want them to keep watching because they like the people and they want to be interested in what happens to those people. Yeah. I mean, in the end, you know, Henry and I both came out of a school of writing which really is much more David Chase, David Simon than it is J.J. Abrams. We came out of a school where it's about people and characters. And what Henry and I both really believe is that it's time for a next evolution in premium drama which is we've done gritty grounded realism I've done it but I did it kind of good audiences want a taste of magic now they want that slightly heightened reality so the idea was to take all of those storytelling elements of those great shows like Breaking Bad and, and Mad Men and infuse them with a little David Lynch a little Haruki Murakami a little bit of you know that other and so you could still tell stories that were very character based and we do and yet still have that ongoing stretch and still having that character evolution and having a compelling mythology that creates a world that the audience not only just sort of watches but they want to be a part of I, for me success in this show will be if you know we're get, we somehow get to season 2 and audience members are literally creating little photographs of what they dreamed last night and putting them on Instagram and flagging Falling Water USA okay. did you have to come up with a unified look for the dreams or can the dreams be as varied as all our well, I think every dream is individual, but there's a, a visual grammar to our dreams. And, you know, this was a real point with, and what you guys saw at the screening is very much indebted to the work of Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, who directed the pilot. He and I were that rare combination of the showrunner and the pilot director who were 100% on the same page. Yeah. I mean, it was a really, really blessed collaboration, and, and the show would not be what it is without him. We spent a lot of time talking about the language of the, the dream world. And we liked the idea that dreams are usually subjective, that we want to travel with the dreamer. We want to feel that they're ongoing. We want to feel that they, they move through space the way our dreams did. Um, now, what happens in those dreams is very particular, and different things will happen in different ways. And as our dreamers start running into each other in the dreams, occasionally as the season goes on, weird things will happen. But we also wanted the dreams to have that unified cinematic grammar so that the audience was never really confused about is it a dream, is it not. I never want to do a dream where the audience goes, oh, they're playing the gag where you pretend it's reality and then the guy wakes up and he got shot in the chest and it was just a dream. We will never, ever do that. We will never, ever do the thing where the person jolts out of the dream and goes, Wee! I've never done that in my life. I mean, I know people who have night terrors who don't do that. We want to credit the audience with something that is original and different and has its own weird vibe. And so as a result, you know, while all the dreams will always be different, we also wanted a unified sense of the language of cinema. And that's one of the other things about the show is we... Television is, historically was on a 17-inch box, which is why it was a medium close-up and somebody going yak, 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 yak. 
Everybody's got 55 inches now. Everybody's got surround sound in 5.1. It's time to really bring cinema to television. Yeah, the cinematography of it. I was, it just tells its own story. It's exactly. Say it's really good. You know, I mean, I'll put it this way. The average script for an episode of Moonlighting was it 19, 19, 30, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, was about 75 to 80 pages. The average script for an episode of Falling Water that, that runs traditional episode length is 39 pages. We are a show that deals in silence. We are a show that deals where the dialogue is sparse on purpose, where we want the images to be the thing that drive. And that's non traditional television. And that's one of the things I'm really excited by. And I, I cannot say enough about how USA has supported the idea of trying to do cinema on television. Shelley Johnson's your cinematographer. For the pilot, yes. Yeah, she's, I mean, she's, you know, expe she, um, he's um, expendable, and, you know. Um, um, Captain America. Captain America. Like, yes. what, what is it about those? The cinematography of those pieces, those big pieces that you want to. Well, I think the funny thing, what attracted me to Shelley's work was the artistry he brought, not only to really poppy pieces like Captain America, but some of his, his lesser known stuff, is he really was an artist, and he really did paint with light, and the collaboration of him and Juan Carlos was really interesting, because um, Shelley is the type of DP who really pre-plans everything. And Juan has sort of got that Spanish sensibility where he's feeling his way through things, like he's constantly adjusting the shot. Every take, Juan is trying to figure out how to make this shot the best shot of the movie. And the two of them together were this wonderful combination. And Shelley would literally, every night, we'd finish wrap, a 12-hour day on the pilot. He would go and personally color time the dailies every day. Wow. He had a commitment to making sure this show looked original. And so, you know, Shelley is unfortunately out of our price range as a series DP. Shelley came back and he's met with uh, Richard Rakowski, who's our current DP. And that style and that sort of vignetting around it and that idea of using anamorphic lenses, which is a whole discussion in and of itself, it's in the series. We are not letting you down when we go from pilot to series. In fact, it was something that actually Juan and I both thought we were going to have a fight about, which was the use of anamorphic lenses. And I don't know if you guys know your cameras. Yep. I don't, you know, that television tradition doesn't like it, you know, but we're, we're showing it 16 by 9, we're clipping off the pillars on the outside, but we get that cinematic feel, that depth, that flaws, the, the natural flares, all of which is terrific. One of the fights, if we're really successful, I want to show a letterbox next year. I want to add the pillars. I want to really get that anamorphic frame. Because again, it goes back to that idea. Everybody's got a big television now. Let's show them a movie every week. I mean, that's one of the reasons I think Game of Thrones is so powerful. I mean, the whole battle episode this last season of Game of Thrones was just like, I haven't seen a movie do war that well in 10 years. We want to go compete with the best looking shows on television, and USA is giving us all the tools to do it. They let us stay in New York for series. That's always the value. Oh, we shot the pilot and such and such, and now we have to go to unnamed Canadian city. Um, <laughs> we said New York is fundamentally part of the character of this show. And it is. You know, that shot of Burton when he's there and you're sort of doing, dollying in on his back, it's just like the city's just out there. The shot's out the window. That's actually the location we found, and Juan was sitting there going, I can see that room over here from here. That's how we should do that shot. It wasn't scripted. You would see out the window. I couldn't write that room. But that's the advantage of having a director like Juan Carlos, you know? And it's the advantage of, of you know, really embracing that. And uh, there are so many talented people who work on this show. I mean, our writing staff, we have a, you know, an award-winning novelist, Nam Holmes, you know? Um, We've got directors, I mean, uh, Ellen Curris, who was the DP on Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Nine, is right now probably on my phone calling me because they're late. Oh, no, it's uh, Owen Mahoney, who's one of our co-EPs, uh, another experienced television guy. We've got a playwright whose current play has got Edie Falco in it at the roundabout. I mean, we have a diverse set of talents. And the show in series does take on a slightly novelistic tone. Again, because I'm not doing a procedure. I don't want to do a procedural. That's to me. <laughs> you know, not that I don't watch procedurals, not that I don't enjoy them, but that's not what my little squirrel trap brain was interested in this week. Yeah, and it's also exceptionally well cast. So can we talk about like working with the cast and bringing a particular group of people together? Oh, I couldn't talk about them enough. They are, you know, our, first off, our three leads are phenomenal. I'll talk about them first, and then I'll talk about all the supporting people. I also adore. Um, I got to start by talking about Lizzie, uh, who plays Tess. Um, that was a role like we saw, I don't know, 50 actors, actresses in Los Angeles who came in one after the other after the other. Lizzie was traveling with her boyfriend at some ashram somewhere and was in a yurt and self-taped on an iPhone. And I it came in over the transom one day and we were getting frustrated and I watched it and I said, that's it. I never made her retape, never made her re-audition. That was her test tape for that one. It 
was that good. She is this part. She has an instinctive understanding on it. And I had I had not been an American Horror Story fan, so I hadn't seen her run on that. I hadn't seen her run on the strain. She just came in and she just was the part. And she is phenomenal. She is like one of the reasons I ever leave set is because I know it's a Lizzie scene and she's gonna be great. She just knows this character inside and out. Um, the Burton was not originally black, was not originally British. Um, was probably originally 20 years older. Um, but David Ajula just walks on the screen and you go, oh yeah. You know, my joke with David is that he should be Bond. You know, and get, after if the show's a hit, he's gonna be Bond. He is, you know, he's that guy. He's just got such natural charisma, such a smart actor, such a talented, skilled guy, and just walks on screen and gives you a presence. And the great thing is we take him down into the pit of despair this season, which makes me giggle and I enjoy. And he's just amazing. He's, you know, he's terrific to work with. Um, you know, and his character is one, it's a very internal character. He doesn't talk a lot. He's not expressive of his internal monologue. Again, we're not a show where anybody spouts their internal monologue. You kind of have to infer it from their behavior. Um, so to have somebody who's that, you know, sort of expressive with just minute adjustments, you know, and he's just terrific. And then we got Will. I mean, you could not come up with a sweeter man than William Lee, who, what's really interesting is Will, when he got cast in a lot of conversation, he goes, you realize traditionally Asian men don't get to play this well-rounded a human being. And I'm like, really? I hadn't noticed it one way or the other. It wasn't anything that was conscious. I wasn't consciously setting out to do diversity. I was consciously setting out to have three great actors. And I ended up with, you know, uh, a black Brit, um, an Asian male, and, you know, a French woman. <laughs> and so it's one of those things because it also felt like New York. I needed people who felt like New York, and because New York is a place where everybody comes from everywhere. There is no one world, and you're always bumping up against each other, and it goes again to that New Yorkness being part of the idea of if we're saying our dreams are all connected and on top of each other, well, what place are people connected on top of each other, but kind of in denial about it? It's New York. In the same way, we're in denial that our dreams are all one dream. And there are a dozen other actors I really want to talk about, because Zach Orth is just like... Zach, I mean, I didn't even read him. He just, I just said, Zach, you want the part? <laughs> you know, that was, that was a no-brainer just to offer it to him. You know, he brings such a humor and depth and subtlety to what could very easily become shtick one way or the other. And Bill is a really intriguing character because, you know, everyone's going to go, oh, he's the bad guy. Oh, no, wait, he's a good guy. No, wait, he's a bad guy. No, wait, what is he? And then that's, I'm like, my answer is yes. <laughs> Bill is interesting, you know? And that's what's fun about actually all the characters. And you didn't see in the pilot, but um, we've cast Tessa's mother is played by Trudy Styler, um, and she's phenomenal. The actress who plays Helena, uh, Francesca Faraday, uh, you know, sort of the, the boss that flirts with Burton, she's ridiculously talented. And, you know, just sort of up and down, we've managed these great New York actors. And, again, that's the advantage of being in New York, is just the talent base for actors there is huge. But what I also would say about all of them, they all feel like they belong in the real world. They all feel like, oh, I know that person. And that's the other thing, is the advantage is they don't feel like they're actors. They don't feel like they've been on 15 TV shows. They feel like you are discovering these characters on your own. And that is one thing I like about casting. I tend to try to cast people you don't know too well. That's why I cast Jason Clark in Brotherhood. Um, I like people who the audience, for them, they are that character. Because then the audience is engaged in not some long-running history of, oh, three shows ago they were such and such, but they're engaged with this person, this story, right now. I want the audience to love this world. I want the audience to want to be a part of this world.